feel like we need to do that for a moment. Can you just sing that? Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Can you let your praise just begin to resonate that this morning? Oh, can you just begin to thank him for the victory that you have to come into this house and just simply begin to say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just begin to thank Him. Thank Him for the, for the cross. Thank Him for Calvary. Thank Him for the blood that was shed for you and for me. Amen. That you could come into this place this morning. Amen. That you've been purchased with a price. You weren't deserving of it, but He did it anyway. Amen. Praise God. You didn't deserve it. But he still carried that old rugged cross up to that hill. Oh, you didn't deserve it, but he still took those nails in his, in his hands and his feet. And those thorns on his head. We didn't deserve it, but he did it. And it's through that blood that you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been sanctified. Amen. Praise God that you have the victory this morning just simply to come into this house and to raise your voice. And hallelujah just simply means praise the Lord. Is anybody coming to this house today to praise the Lord? Can we do that once again? <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank Him for the victory. Death could not hold Him. The grave could not stop Him. We're getting a little taste of Resurrection Sunday right here, right now. Hallelujah. Praise God, and I'm glad that I serve a risen king. He reigns on high. Amen. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? But thanks be to God. Amen. Praise God. You've got something to be thankful for this morning as you come into the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God, because the scripture says he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we come to celebrate that today. Amen. Praise God. You may return to your seats for a moment. We're going to do some announcements. Ushers, go right ahead. You can go ahead and begin and take up this morning's tithes and offering. Amen. But I've come to worship a risen king this morning in this house. Thankful for the victory that he has purchased in my life and in your life. Amen. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor and say he did it for you. Turn to your other neighbor and said he did it for you as well. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As we just sang about, we have Resurrection Sunday just now two weeks away. Amen. I'm getting, we're getting a little foretaste of it here this morning, but I'm looking forward to what God's going to do here on May, March 31st, that last Sunday of this month. Amen. Praise God. You ought to get excited about that. And, Invite somebody, invite your guests, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers. Amen. So as you walk out today, there's little cards that you can grab back on the back there in the kiosk. Little invitation cards that uh, you can stick in your purse. Grab several of them or in your wallet even. They're small enough. But pass them out. Invite someone to come with you on Resurrection Sunday. They're going to go somewhere. They might as well be coming with you to the house of the Lord on Resurrection Sunday. Amen. But most of all, be in prayer. Be in prayer for that Sunday morning that God would have his way. Amen. As we always say, too, make sure to take some notice and make sure to park out. Leave the good spots for all the visitors that are going to be here. And when you come into the sanctuary, just go ahead and scoot on in. Leave those in seats for visitors and guests. Amen. Make, make them feel welcome in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Also, that week leading up to Easter, that Wednesday, not this Wednesday, so don't get confused. The following Wednesday, the Wednesday before uh, Easter, we'll be changing our service. We'll be moving that to Thursday for Mahdi Thursday in uh, commemoration of 
the Last Supper. We'll be having communion here on that Thursday night, so you don't want to miss that. There will be a special time leading up to Easter weekend. Amen. Praise God. And then also that Friday night, there will be an all-church prayer on Good Friday. So make sure you mark that on your calendars as well and be a part of that as well. And then that Sunday morning, Kid Space is going to be having a special service for all the kids. So you can help them out because they need some candy donations. So there's some black bins around the, the church campus as you're at the store, whatever it might be. Pick up some candy, bring it to church, drop it in the bins, and I know that they will be blessed by your donation. Amen. Praise God. And then right after service today, you don't want, want to miss some good brisket. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't want to miss it. We want to help out all the AYCers as they're still collecting funds. I think uh, there's still four out of the, the, the people that still need fundraising, so you can help them out this morning. Uh, you'll get great brisket. Uh, Brother Gus, I think, cooked them all. Amen, right? She's over there shaking her head. Yeah, he cooked it. He was up all probably all night, so you don't want to miss that. If you can help them sell out, I was talking to Sister Christina this morning. Uh, I think they need about $7,000, $7,500 still for all the ones that are remaining. If you get out there and you buy out all the brisket plates, if you buy out all the desserts, they're selling T-shirts. So if you want to buy a T-shirt as well, if you do all those things and then they have a little barcode, if you want to even give a little bit extra, you could probably help them get 4000 of it right here today. So help them out. I know they're excited about the mission endeavors that they have coming up over the summer. So uh, be a part of that and stay right after service and be a blessing to the youth. Amen. Next Saturday, March 23rd, the youth will be having a youth service at 6 to 9 o'clock here at the the church and the chapel. Don't miss that. Amen. Let's all stand. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Remember Jose Garcia, he's going to be having surgery this coming week. That's a prayer request of Sister Therma Garcia. Also remember Hella, Helena Aiken and her children. Also Aria Guzman as she's recovering from surgery. Amen. Also continue. Remember Sister Shalene, she had surgery. Then some complications, had to go back in. She's back out of the hospital again, but we continue to lift her up in prayer. Ask God to be with her. Also be with uh, the Dobbins. Continue to lift them up in prayer. Amen. And one other special request, Brother Steve Miller said that they are off to several different prison ministries this morning to ask that God's favor would be upon them. Amen. As they continue to petition and ask God's will to be done in the various services that they're having. Amen. Praise God. If you've got a need on your heart, why don't you just raise your hand this morning? Amen. And let's just begin to call on the name of the Lord. God, by your stripes, your word says that there is healing. By your stripes today, God, there is deliverance. By the stripes that you bore for each and every one of us in this house, we weren't deserving of it. We certainly... We fell, we fell well short of it. But God, we're thankful that you came, that you did it. God, because of those stripes this morning, there's a healing virtue that can flow throughout this place that can begin to minister and strengthen and anoint and encourage. Amen. Praise God throughout this house this morning. God, let your presence reign. Let that anointing, God, begin to flow amongst your people. God, let us just become in this house as we sung about already, just to give you our hallelujah, our, our, our highest praise, Lord, to praise the name of the Lord for what you have done, for the victory that you have purchased in each and every one of our life. Hallelujah. Can you just begin to praise him this morning? Can we just begin to thank him once again? Thank you, Lord, for that healing touch. Thank you, Lord for that deliverance right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
got you where the victor's crown. You're my help and my defend. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your grace, in your name I will bow down. Oh, in your presence. For you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. And let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Hallelujah. You have
Christ, he has overcome. And because he overcomes, we overcome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He has risen and he has all power. And he is to be praised. Amen. And we do that in this place today. Good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. And it's good to feel the liberty of Jesus Christ. And it's good to be among the people of God. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Joel chapter 2. Amen. I'm excited for Resurrection Sunday. And uh, obviously, it's a... Um, well, it has a holiday feel, you know, just a lot of festivity for Christians, but it's more than that. It is the bedrock of our faith. He has overcome just like we sang, and we will be celebrating the victory of Jesus Christ. And if he can conquer death, he has conquered the ultimate foe of humanity, and we have victory through him and through his victory that he has wrought on our behalf. Resurrection Sunday, you want to be here. Amen. Bring a friend. Joel chapter 2. Amen. Uh, do we have some Bibles in the house? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, you're going to need them today. We're going to read a lot throughout the sermon, so keep them open. And if you're looking for Joel, um, if you see the big books in the Old Testament, prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, after that, you get Daniel, Hosea, then Joel. Amos, Obadiah, right in there, Joel, the prophet Joel. Amen. Joel chapter 2, I want to begin with verse 25 and just read two passages. Joel 2, 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And I want to talk to you this morning about the God who restores. The God who restores. Now, uh, uh, today's message is a little different. We're going to, uh, we're going to have a little Bible history. So uh, I, I hope that today you leave knowing a little more about the Bible and the story of Joel. We're going to have a sober call to action, which is what this book is about. And then we're going to hear a word of victorious hope. Amen. And so I want us to give praise to him again before we're seated. Would you do that? Would you just lift your voice and give thanks to the Lord Jesus for his victory in our lives? Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. I wasn't here Wednesday. I appreciate the good ministry of our assistant pastor, Brother Zach, and... Uh, the good word. If you're not coming on Wednesday, I would encourage you to try to carve that out in your schedule. You'll be blessed. And we have a wonderful time of Bible study here uh, on Wednesday nights. And uh, recently I was asked to serve on the North American Missions Administrative Committee. You re recall every year we take a Christmas for Christ offering. And uh, this committee is the one that allocates that money. So we had the privilege of, uh, I think we were able to issue about 135 grants to church planners. And uh, not only that, but establishing policy and approving metro missionaries, that sort of thing. It's very, uh, very much an honor to be a part of that, so I'll have to miss a couple Wednesdays a year for that. But just wanted you to know uh, where we were, and I appreciate your faithfulness while we're gone. Amen. The God who restores. <clears throat> the book of Joel begins in judgment. The minor prophets, uh, for the most part, are that. They're calling God's people back to where they need to be. Israel had sinned against God and therefore was suffering God's judgment for their sins. The judgment of God recorded here in, in the book is very severe. God sent a locust plague and a drought to the nation of Israel. 
Now this might sound like a small thing to a contemporary person like us living in the Western world with modern conveniences, but locust plagues were exceedingly destructive. In fact, even in modern times, particularly, well, we'll get sidetracked into all that, but, but yeah, even in modern times, there have been documented plagues of locust that have decimated entire regions with their destructive force. The locusts come in large swarms like clouds, literally billions of locusts. They come in, 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 in large waves and sometimes with such intensity that they would literally be a cloud and darken the sky. The sights and the sounds were terrifying. They, they literally devoured everything in sight. They, they would eat the grass. They would eat the leaves on the trees. They would eat the crops in the field. They would eat the fruit off the vine. They, their, their sounds and their sights, it, it was a terrible thing. And they came with a loud, you can imagine, literally billions of these things, these insects, with this loud buzzing and chomping and crunching. It, it was a terrifying thing. And, and, and when they left, there was nothing, there was nothing in their wake but stubble. You may have driven through farmland perhaps after a harvest and after a farmer has gone and tilled under uh, the remnants of the harvest and, and you can just see the little you know, sprigs and sprouts kind of just sticking out of the soil. That's what the landscape would look like after a locust plague. Totally empty. No leaves on any trees. No fruit remaining on any vines. And it, it, was, it was total, absolute destruction. And, and this is what's going on here. And, and as a result, the entire area was shaken. So if there weren't any crops, then that means there's not any food. And if there aren't any crops, that means the livestock don't have anything to eat. And so not only do they lose the crops, they, they begin to lose the livestock, and the livestock begin to die. And if there's not any crops, and if there's not any livestock, then the priests don't have anything to worship with. You can see the ripple effect here. And, and not only that, but it, it was total devastation. Even the sinners, and, and these are all things that I'm just kind of lifting out that, that, that he mentions in the text. Even the sinners and even the drunkards are impacted. They don't have any wine now because there's no fruit. In other words, this is a total and categorical judgment from God that is destructive at every level. It was a total devastation. And not only did the locusts come and destroy everything, but God also shut up the heavens and it would not rain. And so what is left, what is left is very minimal, but it's also exceedingly dry. Now, those of you that have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles back to the book of Joel. And I want to read to you. I want to read to you how this book of Joel begins. And I want to read several verses because I want you to understand what is going on in the book of Joel. And this is the way the book of Joel opens. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Petuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because from, of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong. And without number, his teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined and the new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. 
The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree and the palm tree also and the apple tree and all the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. You can imagine how devastating this was. You can imagine what a tragedy this was to those people when everything is lost and there, there is no hope. There aren't any grocery stores. And FEMA's not bringing the trucks. There is no solution here. You just have to sit it out. And you just have to wait. But what's worst is it wasn't a random act of nature. It was the judgment of God. And not just the random judgment of God, perhaps on, a whole, on the whole world. No, it was the judgment of God because they had sinned. And here's the remedy that God prescribes to them. The remedy that God prescribes is repentance. If you have your Bibles, you might want to follow along. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room, let the priest who minister to the Lord weep before the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And so the call went out, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, and call a sacred assembly. As you begin to read through this passage, it's quite amazing because God tells them, you need to repent. The things that are happening in your lives are not random things. The things... The consequences you're suffering are not just things that just came to you. It is a direct result of what you have done and you need to repent before God. But here's the good part. In response to their repentance, God begins to restore them. In chapter 2 verse 24 as you read down, The threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust and the consuming locust and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. The same God who brings devastation is the same God that in a moment can turn it and he can begin to fill up the vats with oil and he can fill up the vats with wine. This is the same God that can take what is absolute destruction and absolute loss and in a moment according to his will, he can turn the tide in the life of a person who repents. The message of Joel is very straightforward and it's very simple. Repentance is always the starting point of restoration. The story underscores how badly God despises sin. And I think this is something that we need to be reminded of periodically. Is that sin is not just my hang up and sin is not just my shortcoming and sin is not just what I need therapy for and sin is not just what I don't you know, like in my mind. No, sin is an affront to God and it's an offense to God. Sin is when we violate God's law and when we live in rebellion against God's law. And if anything, the book of Joel underscores the reality that God does not smile at sin. He does not wink at sin. He does not turn his head from sin. And this book of Joel underscores the reality and the atrociousness that, that sin brings into our lives. When we have drifted from God, we should repent. That's going to be quiet here this morning. When we have sinned, we should repent. If you are living in sin, you should repent. If you're engaged in tailbearing and gossip, you should repent. If you have lust in your life, you should repent. If you are living in sexual immorality, you should repent. 
If you are not honoring God with your finances, you should repent. In other words, the things that we get away with seemingly in life, it's, it's just because judgment doesn't fall on us immediately does not mean that the all-seeing God is not calling us to righteousness. We need to be very clear in our commitments to live a life that brings glory to God and not a life that just squeaks by. As I mentioned, as I mentioned a few services ago, we should not mistake the blessings of God for the approval of God. Just because we can come in here and feel His presence does not mean that we don't have to repent. Just because we can come in here and be moved by His Word or by worship does not excuse us from repenting. If there is unforgiveness in my heart, I need to repent. If there is bitterness in my heart, I need to repent. If there is hatred and racism and clannishness in my heart, I need to repent. If there are things in me that I have not given to God, I need to repent. But I don't want us to relegate repentance only to gross sins that we all have committed and likely may commit again. God was holding Israel to a higher standard of accountability. He was holding them to a higher standard because they had a higher purpose. The fundamental question for all of us is not whether we are living in sins that would send us to prison. The fundamental question is are we living up to God's purpose in our lives? Are we walking fully into the claim that God has on us? Are we walking fully in the call that God has put upon our lives? And if we are not walking according to our knowledge and according to our revelation and according to our calling then we need to repent. I ask you today to ask yourselves, are you living up to what you know in Scripture? Are you living up to what God has called you to do? Are you living up to what God has asked you to do? Do you remember when He called? Do you remember when you gave Him everything? Do you remember when you said you would go? And I'm asking you today, are you living up to the claim of God on your life? And if we are not living up to that claim... I'm asking us to repent today. I'm asking us to repent from the materialism and to the draw of the world and to the willingness to say yes to the pleasures of this life but no to the call of missions and yes to the pleasures of life but no to sacrificial giving and yes to the pleasures of life but no to teaching a Bible study. We need to repent before God. There is a claim of God. We have a great church, we have a blessed church, and we have been blessed to have the truth of God revealed to us. But to those who have been given much, much is required. I'll just be honest with you, I've been searching my own spirit lately. I told my wife just this week, I told her it can't keep going like this. It can't keep being like this. There's something in me that's calling me to change. I've got to repent. I've got to change. I've got to, something that's got to move in me. I began to think about what God has done. And I began to think about what God wants to do. And it began to convict my spirit. And I said, I have got to call on God. And I've got to repent. Because here's the issue. The issue is not whether or not I commit adultery or whether or not I rob a bank. But am I living my life according to the claim of God? that's on my life. If I am drifting from my purpose, I need to repent. If I am drifting from my consecrations, I need to repent. If I am drifting from sacrifice, I need to repent. There is a claim that God has on all of our lives and we need to walk in it. We don't live to merely get by and we don't live to merely make it to heaven and we don't live merely to just stay out of jail. No, there is a claim of God. He's called us. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are the children of God. We are kings and priests before Him. There is a purpose, a called purpose. We've been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We have a calling on our lives. We have a claim on our lives. New life, there is a call and a claim on this church and we have got to live up to it. I want to walk more fully. I want to walk more fully in what God has asked of me. Israel very well could have made the argument we're no worse than Egypt. Israel could have very well made the argument to God we're no worse than Philistia and we're no worse than Assyria. And we're no worse than all these other nations around us. 
And God says, I'm not holding you to their standard. I'm holding you to your elect standard. There is a calling that is in the life of every believer. And if you've been called by God, there is a response that it requires. And it is a response of absolute and total commitment to Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. Here's the good news that I have for you today. Is that when we turn to God in repentance, He is able to restore the purpose. And He's able to restore the calling. And He's able to restore what He wants to do in our lives. All we have to do is come and say, God, I have fallen short. God, I have sinned against you. God, I have missed a mark. I have relied on myself more than I have relied on you. I cannot do this without you. God, I'm asking you to forgive me. Can I tell you that if you'll turn in repentance to God, there's more that God has for you there's more that he wants to do in your life and I know what some of you are thinking especially the inner core especially my little tiny team that works for the church you're thinking like I thought for a long time until God spoke to me this week you're thinking I'm giving all I've got you're thinking I don't have anything else to give. You're thinking I'm tired because I gave it all. You're thinking I'm broke because I gave it all. Can I tell you those are excuses? God, if he's calling you, he will equip you. And if he's calling you, he will strengthen you. We can never become contented based on the victories of the past. We can't live on testimony. We have to live on the future. We have to live for revival. We have to live for harvest. I want to repent. I want to change. I want to turn. I want to walk more fully in what God has called me to do. There's many reasons for convenience why we don't serve God. There's many reasons of convenience why, don't we, why we don't give God everything in our lives. Convenience, convenience can become the compromise for victory. God, I've fallen short. I'm asking you to forgive me. God, I've missed the mark. I'm asking you to help me. God, I've tried, but I can't do this without you. I felt the Lord, I felt the Lord told me, you've gotten this about as far as you can with your skill. The question is, how much farther do we want it to go? Can I ask you about your life and your ministry and your family and what God's doing in your life? You've done pretty good because you're smart and you're talented and you've got some ability. But this is about as far as you're going to get it without God. And the question is, how far do you want to take it? The question is, how much do you want to be used by God? The question is, how much anointing do you want? How much revival does this church want? How many newcomers do we want? How big is the harvest that will fill this house? What sort of signs and wonders do you want to see? What is it you want to see God do? Can I tell you the end of ourselves is the beginning of the miraculous. And when we have spent what we have and when we step out by faith, God is willing to pick up what's left and God's able to bless it and to move it and to stretch it and to give us a great harvest. Once you get to the end of yourself, so I've been praying, God, forgive me. Here's a challenge. You start comparing yourself. It's like, well, we're a pretty good church. That's not what God called us to be. You look at your own life and think, well, we're pretty faithful. We're involved. That's not necessarily what God called you to be. If you just stop short and say, well, this is it, and then because I'm better than that, that becomes a pretty lame standard. The question is not, how do I relate to all the other believers and all the backsliders. The question is how do I relate to the potential that's inside me? The call of God and the claim of God. How do I relate to the standard that God is calling me to? And does my life measure up to that? So I ask God to forgive me. We don't need half-baked sermons. We don't need ministries that are thrown together late on Saturday night. We don't need saints that just drag in here without having prayed for this service. And we don't need to schedule Pentecost Sunday if nobody's teaching Bible studies right now. And we don't need to learn new worship songs if we're not going to worship to the ones we already know. It gets real crowded up here on the front row when the youth come up, but it gets real quiet about third row back. Folks, I'm telling you, there's a claim of God on our lives. 
and it's calling us to excellence, and it's calling us to depth, and it's calling us to places we haven't known before. God called Israel to repent. He says, you don't get to live like Egypt. You don't get to live like everybody else. Be real easy. You know, feed our ego. People come say, oh man, this church is great. I go to church down the street and they don't have this. Okay, fine. If that's what God's called us to, then we have to live in it. God judges God judges Israel for their their unwillingness to live up to what he's asked them to. Egypt doesn't get judged like this. Assyria doesn't get judged like this. Syria doesn't get judged like this. Babylon doesn't get judged like this. Israel gets judged like this. God said, I picked you when you weren't much at all. He said, I didn't pick you because you were a great nation. I picked you because I loved you. He said, I didn't pick you because you were so awesome. I picked you because I wanted to have a relationship with you. And there was a purpose that I had in your life. A new life, God just as easily can pour out revival in any church across town that he wants to. He didn't pick us because we were big and because we were talented and because we were polished and because we had a good building. He picked us because there was a purpose for us. He picked us because he has a job for us. He picked us because he wanted to use us and he's going to hold us to that standard. I'm telling you, we need to repent before God and reclaim our purpose as a church and say, God, you've got to use us here. We need revival here. We need revival now. We need to have it in this service today. God tells them to repent. He says, you start with the priests. He says, you tell the priests to go weep between the porch and the altar. In other words, don't even come offer any sacrifices. You stop at the front door and get on your face. God's telling them, don't come in this place and worship. They didn't have anything to worship with anyway. It had all rotted away. But he said, you tell the priest because he doesn't have anything to worship with to get on his face between the porch and the altar. What he was telling them was, you get on your face and you weep for the deficiencies in your worship and you weep for the deficiencies in your consecration and you weep for the deficiencies in your lifestyle. He's saying this repentance starts with weeping and recognition of our shortcomings in the presence of God. Don't even walk up to that altar and be praying for that. No, when you come through the threshold, you get on your face before God and you ask God to forgive you and you weep. I ask us today... We like to rejoice and sing, and we should. But there maybe should be more weeping in the house of God. There needs to be more weeping in our times of private prayer. Moments where we recognize our depravity and our smallness. Moments when we recognize, if it had not been the Lord, I wouldn't be here. When we begin to recognize God is truly great and greatly to be praised. When we truly recognize, I messed it up. It's God that got me this far. God told them to repent. He said, go get them all now. You got the priest. Now go get the bridegroom out of her chamber. Because she ain't going to have a very good life if this don't turn around. Go get the groom. Yeah. He said, you farmers, you start weeping too. You've lost everything. You have no career. You have no job. You have no craft. You have nothing. You better pray. He tells the drunkards, you don't have anything to drink. You better pray. In other words, everybody, everybody's life had been flattened and decimated. He said, you better seek God. If you are in hardship and trial, the solution is to seek God. If you are in a situation of loss and confusion, the solution is to seek God. If you're in a situation where you don't have direction or clarity, you need to seek God. It's not going to come from a vacation. It's not going to come from a job. It's not going to come from a new relationship. It's not going to come from another degree. You need to seek God. They gather. He says, I want you to tear your heart, not your clothes. Signs of mourning in the ancient world. They they would literally mourning somebody would die or whatever. Would literally just tear their clothes. And then they would put ashes on them. And and then sometimes they would actually wear what they would call clothing of affliction. It's kind of like a burlap bag. They, They would take off their clothes and they would put that scratchy old bag on just to be in a state of misery and affliction. 
And God said, that's not what I want. He said, I want you to tear your heart. So I'm not interested in the outward symbols of mourning. God says, I want legitimate brokenness and repentance. And then this is what happens. God says, so I will restore now the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. Can I tell you that no matter what you've lost, God can restore it. And I tell you no matter how many waves of locusts have come in your life and eaten the leaves and the stalks and the fruit and everything in between, no matter what's left or not left, God's able to build it back. No matter what you've lost, God is able to restore it. It doesn't matter how bad it was, and it doesn't even matter if it was your fault. When you live in repentance, God is able to turn that thing. You may feel like, well, I lost it and I blew it. You may feel like, well, I don't deserve it. It doesn't matter. Once you have repented of your sins and repented from the state from which you have drifted, God is able to turn things in your life. He's able to restore the years of the... Hey, who sent those locusts? God did. Who sent that judgment? God did. What God is saying, when you get on the same page with me, I can undo what I did in your life. He can undo the blessings but he can also undo the cursing if you get on the same page with God. God is able to bless and he's able to restore. Look at this. He didn't say you just have a new harvest. No. He said I'm going to restore it. I'm going to give it back to you. Somebody needs to recognize it's not over. You may have lost your song but God's got a new song. God can give you back your joy. He can give you back your passion and your ministry and your vision. He can give you peace again. He's able to restore all the years that the locust has destroyed. <laughs> Missed opportunities. My wife and I were talking about someone that wasn't living for the Lord recently. And one of the biggest things that broke my heart was the missed opportunities. Like, okay, they'll get on track someday. I believe that. What about these missed opportunities? What about the years the locusts are eating up? What about the devastation? Well, he said he'd restore it. I don't know how all that works, but I know what God said. And what God is saying is I can fill back up what's missing. God said I can pour back in what's empty. God said I can miraculously fix this. He said if I was able to miraculously destroy it, I can miraculously fix it. Can I encourage us to have faith in God today? And once we've repented in faith to realize that it's time to move forward and it's time to let God use us and it's time to let God's power come in a fresh way and it's time for a fresh anointing. I want to challenge you today. Don't get hung up on lifestyle issues and holiness and all that. I'm telling you, this is a time to get buried in the kingdom of God. If you'll give 100% to the kingdom of God, God is going to reward you. Don't quibble about commitments on the fringe. Just get in with all you've got and watch God do a work in your life. Don't sit on the sidelines of compromise and just dwindle away the opportunity God is wanting to restore and he's wanting to feel and he's wanting to give you something you've never seen or something you haven't seen in a really really long time I want us to stand together and pray some of you have I'll just change that some of us have made some pretty big mistakes and sometimes that that mistake is like a, a conscience in your life and it just follows you everywhere you go. And every time you raise your, raise your spirit to do something, that mistake sits there and says, uh-huh, you can't do that. You, you have failed and it starts reciting all that. The human memory is one of the most, it's one of the most devastating things when it comes to failure. I think that's why I think that's why Paul said, I forget those things that are behind me. I forget them. And I just move on in Jesus' name. 
Can I tell you if you'll repent before God today? And maybe you're saying, well, I haven't done any major sins this week. Are you aligned with your calling? Are you aligned with your purpose? Are you walking fully in the commitments and the consecrations you know you should? Are you walking in the generosity and the kindness of spirit that God's called you to? Are you being what God wants you to be? Or are you like sitting there saying, well, I'm better off than I'm doing okay. There, I could do more. I'm, I'm okay. There's no okay in the kingdom of God. Laodicea was lukewarm. And Jesus said, I wish you were cold because then I could warm you up. Or I wish you were hot because then I could use you. But because you're in the middle and you say you don't need anything, that was their sin. He said, you're naked and you don't realize it. You're poor and you don't realize it. It's a spirit of entitlement. I'm waiting on this opportunity or I'm called to do this or I have served my time. I've done my time. I'm a 19th generation apostolic. It's a spirit of entitlement, Laodicea is. And he said, you don't even realize your poverty. And this is the words of Jesus. This is in red in your Bible. He said, because you're that way, I'm going to puke you out of my mouth. God, no. What a tragedy. I somewhat look like a preacher. We've got online views. I've traveled the world. I've preached the conferences. I'm the preacher. What a tragedy. To stand someday in front of the resurrected Christ and for him to say, you make me sick. I've got to repent. There's a call. There's a claim. I wonder if anybody feels that today. It's not condemnation. It's a call to step up higher. It's not condemnation, but it is conviction. Come on, young people. Don't, don't play your life away. Don't get caught up on your phone and pornography and junk and social media. Don't, don't get caught up in it. You, you're precious. Give your life to God. There's so much more. There's so much more. Would you respond to the Lord right now? He's a God that restores. If we'll repent. <laughs> if we'll repent. If we'll repent. He could fill the vats full again. He can fill the barn full again. Come on, don't give up. I'm trying to reach somebody that has kind of just checked out because of whatever. Don't give up. Don't give up. Come on, repent. Turn. 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 Realign with your purpose. Well, realign with the call of God in your life. Realign with what God spoke to you when your heart was tender and when you were younger and when you said you would say yes. Realign with it. Don't drift from it. Come on, everybody pray right now. Everybody